I want to invite you to imagine three scenarios. And so uh, they're all to do with you being a troop in the midst of battle. And <clears throat> head out, about to go into this, this you know, life or death battle. Uh, but you don't know yet who the, the captain, who the commander is, who your leader is going to be. So scenario one, you're there. And, and this person is going to come out from the tent behind you. And you're standing there with the troops waiting. And this person comes out. And none of you know who the person is. Like, who is this? And you're scratching your heads. And like, do you know this person? Do you know? Like, I don't know. And so because you don't know that individual, it doesn't really give you much you know, confidence in, in the battle that is about to happen. Okay, that's scenario one. Scenario number two is, okay, another person comes out of the tent, and all of a sudden everyone kind of smacks their head because they realize, oh my goodness, this is Captain Incompetent. And, and you know this person, this is the person who is sit, you know, falling asleep at the back of military class. Uh, this is the person who has a not very good track record. They, they don't really, you know, care much about people. You know, that's not good. Okay, scenario three is all of a sudden this other person comes out. This is like Captain Incredible, and you know this person, and everyone's like giving each other high fives. This is great. We know this person. They care about us. They're competent. They have experience. They're a, a war hero. All the boxes are ticked. And what happens in that scenario is that you have confidence and courage for the battle because you have confidence in the leader. Confidence in the leader. Now, the reason I start like that today is because we're at the start of a journey for several months through uh, the New Testament book of Hebrews. And part of the thing that was happening contextually at that time in history, in the mid to, uh, early to mid-60s, is that a lot of the Hebrews are facing, uh, sorry, the recipients of the letter to the Hebrews were facing persecution, they're facing hardship. And this letter, this book was written because they had kind of lost kind of an understanding about who their leader, Jesus, was and is. And because they kind of had a foggy, foggy understanding and they weren't quite confident in who he was and, and what he is able to do, what was happening is that they were kind of thinking about running for the hills. They didn't think they could do it or face their hardship because they didn't have confidence in that leader. And so the book responds to that and through 13 chapters goes to great length to talk about who Christ is, his power, his goodness, all the stuff that he can do and how he is greater than so many other things. And so they should have confidence in him and the principle that was true for them which is also true for us, is this. You can have courage for the battle when you have confidence in the leader. Okay? So as we start this series, I put a little background video together uh, to kind of get us on the same page that talks about, okay, uh, more, more about the context that was written, who wrote it, when was it written, and some of the things that make it continually relevant for us today. Have you ever faced hardship? Have you ever wondered if Christ actually makes a difference? Have you ever thought about turning back? Have you ever wanted confidence and courage no matter what? Enter the book of Hebrews. This New Testament book is not as well known as the four gospels, but it still shines with powerful truths for the ages and certainly for you and me. The title to the Hebrews was assigned early in the Christian tradition, probably because it discusses ideas that would have been familiar to Christians with a Jewish and Hebrew background. Accordingly, it quotes from the Old Testament over and over again. This anonymous book was probably written in the first century in the early to mid 60s by an educated person who wrote in sophisticated Greek and who clearly knew the Old Testament very well. But why was it written? According to Donald Hagner, there seems to be evidence that the recipients were weakening in their commitment, perhaps in the face of the threat of new persecution. End quote. This persecution was probably under the Roman Emperor Claudius. This may have made some of them second-guess their faith and commitment to Jesus and the importance of meeting together at all. Perhaps they thought it best to go back to their old ways and to stop being different. What is that old expression? A nail that sticks out tends to get hammered down. It is a teaching about the supremacy and sufficiency of Jesus Christ. He is greater than any fear. He is greater than any priest on earth and what they can do. He is greater than Moses. He is even greater than angels. Today, we would add that he is greater than any self-help program. He is greater than any celebrity. He is greater than any political party. He is greater than any ideology. He is greater, greater, greater. Chapter one, verse three gives us the thesis statement for the book. The Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory in the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. The book addresses themes that continue to be relevant, especially when facing hardship, like perseverance, the importance of other people to your faith, faith in action, courage, and being confident in the supremacy of Christ even under the storm clouds of life. Maybe you already know a few of its most famous verses. Hebrews 4.12 is about the ongoing aliveness and power of God's Word. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. 
Hebrews 6.19, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Hebrews 11.1 1 is a famous definition of faith. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And of course, Hebrews 13.8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Have you ever faced hardship? Have you ever wondered if Christ actually makes a difference? Have you ever thought about turning back? Have you ever wanted confidence and courage no matter what? The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. That Jesus, my brothers and sisters, is our king and friend. If you're looking for something other than Jesus, you're looking for something less. What does it look like to live a life of confidence and courage under the rays of his radiance? So hopefully that serves to get us on the same page. So we're going to start at chapter 1, verse 1. If you've got a Bible and you can open it, that's great. If you're at home, uh, you got it, you can make notes in it, that's great. If you've got the Westminster Church app, so the tile that says notes, there's things that you can fill in uh, based on what I'm about to say. So today we're only going to look at three verses. Three verses. That's because these are like a thesis statement that kind of sets our trajectory kind of like a compass uh, for the direction that we are going to be headed in, okay? So I'm reading from the NIV. I'm going to go through these three verses, and it's important that we really kind of uh, get these right as we uh, head forward in this journey together. So, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets, and many times and in various ways, but in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. Pause. So, in the past... Right? God spoke to our ancestors. This is our spiritual ancestors you know, in the faith, you know, through the ages, through the prophets at many times and in various ways. So we know that to be true. Of course, we look at the Old Testament. We can see that God has spoken to his people through the prophets. We think of Moses on the mountain. We think of Samuel in the temple. We can think of you know, Isaiah in the courts of, uh, of influence and authority. We can think of the still, small voice with Elijah. Right. So we know this to be true and in various ways, but... Verse 2, and this marks a change. But, however, in these last days, so in this last major chunk of human history prior to the return of Jesus, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So there's something definitive about what happens in and through Jesus. Definitive, authoritative. And we just need to remember that. that there's not like there's going to be some other prophet who comes along and it's like, okay, that's like, that's basically on par with Jesus. It's not like there's going to be other books that are written and included in the Bible. Something final, definitive, authoritative has happened in Jesus. And then he's going to go on to explain a bit about Jesus, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. Okay, now... A lot of us are used to thinking about Jesus in terms of his earthly life only. We think of that, right? We think of being born in a you know, smelly manger in Bethlehem. We think of him preaching about the kingdom of God. You know, hey, I'm going over to your house, Zacchaeus. Um, crucifixion, you know, much to the shock and awe of his followers. And then the glorious resurrection, those types of things. So what is happening here is, you know, the writer to the book of the Hebrews is bringing our perspective higher, thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, that's all Good, that's powerful, that's so important. However, Christ is also divine. He continues to reign and rule. And he will describe to the book many of the ways that is the, uh, of how that is the case. Okay, So he's kind of, like, kind of like bringing our perspective up to that 10,000 foot view. Um, several years ago, I went uh, skydiving before, before kids. Um, and uh, anyway, a friend, it was a bachelor party for a friend of mine, and he was, he was an adventure seeker. He is an adventure seeker, Jeremy. And uh, so, you know, you have this training, and uh, you go up, and like when you're on the ground, you can see the details of the trees and the, and the grass and the building and everything else. All of a sudden, you go up into this plane, and you look down, and you're like thousands of feet in the air, and all of a sudden, like farmer's fields look like little squares on a checkerboard. You're like, Wow. And I'm about to jump out of this thing. Like, it's crazy. You know, I, I would not do it again. Uh, anyway, that's your own decision. So anyway, up there. But the thing is, like, you have a different perspective up there. Like, oh, wait a second. I can see Toronto. Oh, man, that's, 
That's like Simcoe. It's like you have this different perspective. So I think linguistically here, uh, theologically, what the writer of this book is doing is bringing us up to that 10,000 foot view. He's pointing to Jesus, heir of all things. So imagine our heavenly father saying to his son, Jesus, all I have is yours. He is the heir of all things. So he doesn't just inherit a few churches with some nice pictures of him, a footprints poem, or maybe some songs that pay him tribute, heir of all things. And Jesus speaks and to a part of this in the Great Commission and in Matthew 28, 18, all authority, he says, all authority, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Wow. Heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. As the universe is being made, happening through Christ, he pre-existed his own entry into the world in the manger. This speaks with power to the divinity of in the pre-existence of Christ. Okay, verse three. The Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory in the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Okay, this is radiance. This is the only time that this word is used here in the New Testament. And God's glory is often spoken in terms of light and luminescence, glory, glory, light of the world, this powerful image of Jesus. And it says that he is the exact representation of his being, the exact representation. There was a family in New Jersey, a loved one passed away, unfortunately, and they called into like a tombstone engraving company and uh, put in the order and then... Later, they went to the cemetery to see this tombstone. Uh, it said, you know, the person's name, a son, a father, and a friend. Like, what in the world? Is it a friend or is the guy a fiend? You know? And it's like, it was clearly a mistake, but like a typo on a computer is one thing. This was literally etched in stone. Like, what a, what a, what a bad mistake to have been made, right? And, and the reason I say that is because some people, I think, reading through the scriptures and as they think about their faith, it's like, well, some mistakes surely must have been made about Jesus. You know, a nice guy, a nice prophet, a teacher, sure. But, you know, it, it's got to have made a mistake about his identity, about who he was. Maybe Jesus even himself made a mistake. No. Part of the function of the book of Hebrews is to provide clarity around who he is. He is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being Sustaining all things by his powerful word. Think about it. Sustaining, upholding all things by his powerful word continually, even now. The universes, the stars, sustaining all things is being uphold, upheld and sustained by Jesus and his powerful word. Just think of that. The mountains and the oceans right now being upheld and sustained by Jesus and his powerful word. The nations, the ocean, like everything being abstained right now by Jesus and his powerful word. Your strength, your footsteps, your hope, your breath is right now being up, upheld and sustained by Jesus and his powerful word. He has an ongoing universal ministry right now. Amazing. In case it's not clear, theologian John Calvin says, everything will quickly disintegrate if not upheld by his goodness. Everything will quickly disintegrate if not upheld by its goodness. And if it's not clear, I think what I would say, how I would put it is this. If you're looking for something other than Jesus, you're looking for something less. Because Jesus is spoken about in the ultimate supreme terms. All right, continuing. This is verse 3b. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Okay, so a couple of things. At the right hand of the majesty in heaven, we talked about that on Ascension Sunday. This is Jesus in the cosmic control room. The one who needs to be in charge is. And the word majesty there is uh, another word for God. But we can't miss over that he had provided purification for sins. Now, <clears throat> this is like biblical shorthand for what he has done for us on the cross. So, you know, here's the, here's the thing. And as I, as I kind of alluded to earlier, we all sin. You know, I'm, I'm the biggest sinner I know. And it's just something we do, and we're broken, and we, and we you know, transgress the commands. We are selfish. We don't always do what we should. This is a part of our fallen nature. And there's a consequence for that. Eternal death and wrath, which I think we all want to avoid. right? And so, God in his great love, in the person of Jesus, comes to us. And on the cross, he absorbs the consequence of our disobedience. So there's a consequence to, to, to our sin and our brokenness and what we do. And so Jesus absorbs what we deserve. And that's, 
central to the Christian gospel, the good news. He, he takes what we, and, 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 and in return, he gives us forgiveness and reconciliation and peace with God that we couldn't get any other way. Now think of this in context for a second. This isn't just any random person. This is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being coming personally for you and me, dying in our place to give us all good things. Wow. If that doesn't convince you that you are loved and you are cared for and that you have value beyond anything you could ever imagine, I don't know what will. It should fill us with this powerful, radical gratitude. Us receiving a gift like this through faith in him and what he has done makes winning the lottery look like a trite joke. What a beautiful, beautiful gift. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so the start of this, I talked about three scenarios, right? And these three scenarios, you know, you're kind of there and you're on the battle line and you're going in and you're waiting for your leader and then scenario one, scenario two, scenario three. And we all want to be in that scenario three where we have confidence in our leader. And what happened with those people, the recipients to the book of the Hebrews, is that they needed clarity. They needed confidence in who their leader was so that they could have courage for the battle. And it was true for them and it's also true for us for whatever you're facing. And I trust that you're all facing your own battle of some sort, right? You have courage for the battle when you have confidence in your leader. You have courage for the battle when you have confidence in your leader. Uh, there was a boy who grew up in a small town, and his, his father died when he was young, which is tragic. But he wanted to know who his father was and what his father was like. And so as he met people throughout the village, he would ask them, hey, did you ever go fishing with my dad? Did you ever know my dad? What, what, what sort of things did he say? And, uh, and, you know, tell me some stories. And he was kind of gathering these little bits of information, putting together this composite view of what his father was like. And I think on a deep level, we all want to know what our Heavenly Father, what God is like. Well, if we're going to have courage in our leader, we know that to look to Jesus is to know what God is like. He is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. And so how we answer that question about what he is like is we look to Jesus. But we need increasing clarity as to who he is, the significance of what he has done. And the greater our clarity is, the more courage we will have for the battles that we face. So I want you to ask yourself a question. Just ponder this in the coming week. If someone was to ask you to describe Jesus, what would you say? Tell, t tell me what he's like. You know, I think sometimes we can fall into the first two scenarios. Maybe, you know, we don't know much or maybe we haven't paid attention or maybe our, our understanding of him is not biblical or it's twisted or we've, we've heard wrong information or whatever. We all want to be in that third scenario confident about who he is. And I'm going to invite you to ponder that question, and I'll ask you it again, you know, at the end of the series when we hit Advent. What is Jesus like? How would you describe it? What is, who is Jesus like? Okay? Final thought. In the, uh, the, as the series begins. Okay, the movie Braveheart, um, Mel Gibson plays William Wallace, and I'm sure some of you have seen it. And, uh, you know, there's this one scene where these Scottish troops are being prepared to go into battle, and you can tell they're, they're weary and they're worn and they're dirty. They're, they're about to go back, right, because they're facing their bigger, stronger, you know, English oppressors, right? And all of a sudden, in comes William Wallace, played by Mel Gibson. And William Wallace is this, like, war hero, and, and, and he's trying to convince them that he's William Wallace and that, you know, they, they, can, they can do this. they got to think about their, their families and their liberties and their freedoms, and they can't, you know, stand this tyranny, but... This is before YouTube, before Instagram, before all this stuff. And so they don't know what William Wallace looks like. And so he has to kind of convince them that he is, in fact, William Wallace. And it's a really moving scene. It's like he's like going around on his horse with his, you know, William Wallace, Mel Gibson hair flowing. And he's got, you know, this patriotic blue and white on his face. And he, you know, he's kind of rallying the troops, literally. And at the end of the speech, he says something like, you know, they may take our lives, but they will never take our freedom, right? They had courage for the battle because they had confidence in their leader. How much more so is that true for you and me on a spiritual, grander plane because of our commander and king, who is Jesus? Let's journey through the book of Hebrews together. Amen.